Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Ashley Nunes. I am the director for R Street's Competition Policy Program. R Street is a nonpartisan, nonprofit public policy research organization. Our mission is to engage in meaningful policy research and outreach that promotes free markets and limited effective government. We are dedicated to building broad coalitions and working with a variety of groups who share our public policy goals. And we work extensively on both state and national policy and focus on issues that other groups tend to neglect. Our specialty is tackling issues that are complex but don't necessarily grab headlines. That said, today, we will be discussing a topic that has been in the headlines, the Child Tax Credit or CTC. Introduced with bipartisan support and signed into law by President Bill Clinton in 1997, the CTC provides income support to households with children. Since its introduction, the program has undergone numerous changes that have dramatically expanded how much assistance American families can receive. And more importantly, I think for our discussion this afternoon, which Americans can receive that assistance. Most recently, the CTC was expanded, albeit temporarily, by President Joe Biden, a move that has been praised and criticized in equal measure. This afternoon, we have assembled a talented and respected panel that will examine and discuss various aspects of the CTC, its efficacy, and what its future, if any, should look like. The discussion builds on a panel we had this morning during which we also discussed various aspects of the CTC. We hope to expand on some of those this afternoon. We are especially grateful to the Robin Hood Foundation that has made this conversation possible. Today's conversation coincides with the release of our report on the CTC, its history, legislative changes, and distributional impact. The report, which is linked on our website, documents compelling, consistent, and clear evidence of inequities in benefits realization. We find that married couples are better positioned to claim the full benefit as our single fathers compared to single mothers. More broadly, we document that when it comes to claiming the CTC, it pays to be married, particularly if the claims beneficiary is female. Our report proposes ways to address this inequity while preserving what is arguably the most contentious part of the program, its work requirement. That requirement and other aspects of the CTC are what we hope to tackle today through rigorous debate. So uh, without further delay, let me uh, introduce this afternoon's panel. Kevin Cornett is staff director at the United States Congress Joint Economic Committee. Previously, he served as, as executive director at the Comprehensive Income Data Set Project. He was a chief economist at the President's Council of Economic Advisors and was a research fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Chuck Marr is the Vice President for Federal Tax Policy at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. From 1999 to 2004, he was an economic policy advisor to Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle and a senior advisor for budget policy at the National Economic Council during the second term of President Clinton. Isabel Sawhill um, is a senior fellow uh, at the Brookings Institution, and she served in the Clinton administration as well as the Associate Director of OMB. Garrett Watson is a Senior Policy Analyst at the Tax Foundation, where he conducts research on federal and state tax policy. And last but certainly not least is Sophie Collier, a Research Director at Columbia University Center on Poverty and Social Policy. I just want to say it's very difficult to be well versed on any aspect of child poverty without uh, reading some of Sophie's work. So, uh, Sophie, thanks so much for joining us. 
Um, I think probably a good place to start um, is, is as follows. This morning we talked at length about you know, the CTC, what it looks like, what it has historically looked like, and who gets the benefit. Sophie, I wonder if you could, if I could start with you when you could talk a little bit um, about who does get the benefit and more specifically and appropriately, who is priced out of the child tax credit? Yeah, definitely. And thanks for so much for having me and I'm really honored to be here and to be with all of you. Um, so yeah, so both historically and today, low and moderate children in low and moderate income families have been disproportionately ineligible for the full child tax credit. Um, about more than 20 million children are ineligible for the full CTC under current law, and it's about one in three children. But when you look across kind of different, different demographic groups, you see, and different types of family structures, and even geographically, you see how this kind of ineligibility and disproportionate ineligibility compounds other forms of economic insecurity. So, um, for example, we know that being a single parent has, you know, resource and time constraints that are different than being a single parent, uh, married, if you're in a dual parent family. We know that there's kind of fewer social services available in certain rural areas compared to metropolitan areas. We know that children who face you know, historical and current structural disadvantage are more likely to face economic hardships. And children in all of these groups are disproportionately ineligible for the full CTC. So about half of Black and Latino children are ineligible for the full CTC, 40% of children in rural areas, 50%, uh, close to 50% of children in larger families by nature of the fact that you just need more income in all order to qualify for the full credit as you have, as your family grows. Um, and also about more than 40% of, of children in the Southern states and Southwestern states are ineligible for the full CTC. So overall, this is one of the largest federal like expenditures made to directly benefit children, but children who would likely benefit from the most from it the most are disproportionately ineligible from reaping its full benefits and are kind of treated differently than than other children. So, so, so if I can follow up on that with you, so you you, you know you provided an overview of effectively who is in poverty, right? Um, is that is that an accurate? I, I mean, I think you're thinking. If you think about the phase-in structure of the CTC, it's, it, it takes a while to phase into a, you know, a high um, until you actually receive the maximum credit. So yeah. for, a family, for a family with three children, it's like $46,000 in order to receive the full benefit. So I think it's in and near poverty. You know, you're talking about people kind of living um, below, um, not just, just below the poverty line, but also like close to 200% of the poverty threshold as well. Right. So one of the, the things that came up this morning is when we were talking a little bit about poverty is trying to understand how people in poverty have fared over time. So Kevin, if I can, if I can turn to you, in a, in a recent paper that you, you co-authored, you, you said you noted the following uh, when it comes to how people have fared over time with regards to poverty. Our preferred estimates indicate that single parent family poverty declined by 62% over time while it only fell by 45% using survey data alone. Research relying on consumption data has found that the well-being of single mother families had increased throughout the distribution after welfare reform with larger gains for the most disadvantaged. Could you talk about that a little bit? Because I think there's this sort of question as to whether or not poverty has gotten worse, whether or not it's gotten better, if, if so, for whom? Yeah, thank you for the question and thanks for including me in this uh, distinguished panel. Um, so to answer your question, um, the paper you're referencing, we look at trends in poverty um, for single parent families going from 1995, kind of as welfare reform was starting to happen until uh, 2016, so about a 20 year period. And we use what's called the comprehensive income data set um, which is unprecedented in linking survey data with administrative records from tax records, um, government transfer programs and the like. Um, and this builds a much more accurate understanding of what people's actual incomes are given the vast amount of underreporting um, in surveys. And so what we find is as you note that there was a dramatic decrease um, in poverty and even a decrease in deep poverty 
um, for single parent families. And the big implication for this discussion is that welfare reform went from a system where we provided unconditional cash transfers to uh, low income uh, families, generally single parent families often headed by a single mom um, towards a system that required work with the, the TANF program and rewarded work with the earned income tax credit. The child tax credit is very much like the earned income tax credit in that it requires work. Um, there has been a lot of research finding that the, the earned income tax credit has lots of benefits um, for children and for the parents. So it increases employment. It also helps the children. The child tax credit reforms that we're discussing and that happened in 2021, um, those reforms do away with the, the EITC-like structure of the CTC. It gets rid of um, the work requirement, the work reward. Um, and as a result, we threaten some of that progress that we made in, in welfare reform. Um, and I would just note that the CTC is designed as a tax credit. Um, it's not the only program that we have for low-income families. And so while um, I do think it's important that we have work promoting programs like the CTC and the EITC, um, we also have other important programs like food stamps, um, WIC, housing assistance, Medicaid, um, SSI, lots of other programs that are meant um, to help low-income families, especially single moms with kids um, that people have identified. Kevin, if I can just push back on, on this one particular thing you said, you were talking about this notion of underreporting of income, which of course um, impacts eligibility estimates for who actually claims the benefit. Um, and I think there has been quite a bit of work that has been done, you know, showing that the when it comes to underreporting of income, this is typically concentrated on the lower end uh, and on the upper end of the income distribution. Um, but that being said, I mean, is the underreporting of income that significant enough to to drive changes and who qualifies for the benefit and who doesn't? So this is in terms of uh, understanding who is in poverty. So it is a drastic problem. So for instance, only half of food stamps um, are actually that are paid out are actually reported on surveys. And so when we use surveys like the current population survey, um, that survey is going to understate the amount of income that's already going to poor, um, uh, poor low-income families. So it's very important that we link this administrative data so we have an accurate understanding of the level of hardship and where some of the holes are in our um, existing safety net. So staying with the, the theme of hardship and, and trying to understand um, how hardship is distributed across the, the United States, um, Chuck, um, I think you and your colleagues recently at CBPP, you, you, you know, I think you, you had a report out in which you were documenting what the magnitude of that hardship is. Um, and this is what you, what you and your colleagues said, uh, based on your analysis, an estimated 9.9 .9 million children, assuming the ARP was not renewed, are at risk of slipping back below the poverty line or deeper into poverty. This includes 3.8 million Latino, 2.9 million white, 2.1, 2.1 million Black, 426,000 Asian, and 280,000 American Indian or Alaska Native children. Chuck, why do these disparities exist? Oh, thank you for the question, Ashley. Thanks for having me. And kudos to your uh, op-ed this morning, shining a light on uh, single moms and the child tax credit. I thought that was, was excellent. Um, yeah, no, the, obviously the United States is, has, a, has a long history of, you know, discrimination in, in many areas, of housing, of jobs, of criminal justice. So those, those messages are still there and still some discrimination is present. So you have wide gaps in income and uh, in wealth by race, by different family types, obviously today. But just pick it up, I think, you know, Kevin makes a good point that over time, you know, these that they have had this reduction in poverty because of these programs have been success, so successful. You've had expansions over time, many times in EITC and the child tax credit to the point now that combined, they, they lift more kids out of poverty than any government program, right? They're usually important. Um, but we saw this, but you still, you know, Sophie said, you still you still have a long way to go, right? You still have half the black kids who were left out from the full CTC, half Latino kids, 
40, 50 percent of kids in rural areas. And so that was what was so exciting about the Rescue Act is that it, it fixed all that, right? The big flood, it addressed it. And all of a sudden, poor kids are getting the same as middle class kids. And look what happened, right? I mean, all of a sudden, July starts and the money's deposited in these accounts. The parents take the money, they buy food, they buy, you know, they pay the electrical bills. Fewer kids going to bed hungry. I mean, it worked out exactly as planned. And the worry that they, all of a sudden all these parents stop stop working, it didn't happen, right? It's a short time, but it didn't happen. So I think you know it was just a tremendous success, and that's only the short term benefit. I think you know later in the conversation, hopefully we'll get into the long term benefits for kids of just that extra income was huge for people. I mean, and think we certainly about will. Yeah. We certainly will be talking about the long term impact for kids. Yeah. So I just when, so, yeah. Go ahead, but, please. Yeah. So, but Kevin is, you know, he, he wrote a paper and I understand we'll, we'll talk more about that as well, but it's afraid of a sort of unintended consequence if you give the full TTC. But I think it's important to note, we can talk about the specifics of the paper, but there's a wide range of estimates, right? Kevin tends to be a little more aggressive than some others on his estimates. But even if you accept Kevin's, I think he would concede, if you, if you accept his paper, you still find he finds that his, his prediction is that 90, over 97% of parents would keep working, right? And if you combine it over, look at the whole workforce, that's over 99% of people who are working would still work. So, you know, it's, we got to think about it, but it's a, you know, it's a very small, and again, we'll talk more later, right, about the benefits, but combine that sort of minimal employment effect to the huge benefits for kids throughout short term and really throughout their lives. So I think I think what you were referring to are the uh, the income and the substitution effects, and I know we had some panelists on this morning that were having a vigorous debate about, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, these effects on on the intensive versus on the extensive margin, uh, and we will certainly talk about uh, about uh, the work incentive or disincentive shortly. Uh, Garrett, if I can turn to you, you know, before we talk about. Uh, what the tax code should look like, et cetera. Um, all else being equal, what do you see as being a way um, to rectify um, disparities that we see in poverty when we consider the federal tax code? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Of course, one, one thing that's important to, uh, to remember in the, the child credit discussion is uh, this credit has served, of course, multiple purposes. I think it was really uh, helpful in the first panel discussion when we thought about uh, how much, uh, both historically and moving forward, we should consider this credit to be ameliorating uh, poverty and improving mobility for children and low-income households who may not have access to it under uh, the current law design. There's also, of course, a Ben consideration in the tax code more broadly, uh, both in the in the 2017 tax law discussion and uh, prior to that, and I think will be important moving forward on how the tax code uh, for all earners, regardless of income, uh, treats households of, uh, of different uh, different family and household size. And the child tax credit is a component of that. Uh, and as part of the 2017 tax law, what happened was the personal exemption, which was another uh, part of the tax code that tried to provide some uh, adjustment for, for households that are earning income but have a larger household size was suspended. And in its place, it was sort of swapped out with the, the expanded standard deduction, which reduced the number of people who itemized. And uh, a larger child tax credit that also was paired with uh, a larger uh, refundability uh, for, for lower income households. And that on net was, was, was trying to provide that equivalent swap for households uh, of various family sizes. And so that, that's another thing important uh, component of this, uh, not only for low income households, but for households up and down the income spectrum, think holistically about uh, moving forward when we think about expanding the credit, uh, what that might look like and whether or not we need to uh, also adjust uh, that personal exemption moving forward uh, for those folks. Um, and, and I think the other point that, that's important when we think about the tax code and poverty is, uh, and something that Chuck alluded to a little bit, is uh, we will have to consider uh, how these changes will uh, impact uh, particular labor supply over the, the long term, right? The Congressional Budget Office and other folks um, uh, typically find that labor supply adjustments take three to upwards of eight years to fully respond to changes to work incentives. Uh, the magnitude, of course, uh, is hotly debated, and uh, uh, how much that will be, uh, how much we want to trade that off with the impacts on poverty that are highlighted by my fellow panelists is an important uh, normative question. Uh, but that is uh, something that complicates our ability to evaluate the expanded credit uh, under the Build Back Better uh, proposal and under the rescue plan last year. Is uh, that it was, uh, if it remains temporary, that's going to make it harder to evaluate empirically. Um, but as we get more data, of course, that'll be uh, easier to, uh, to determine. 
uh, if this uh, moves forward uh, in a, on a longer term basis. Um, so we've, we've been talking a lot about poverty. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the questions is whether or not programs like the CTC um, are effective in alleviating poverty, but also what the long term implications of these policies are. Um, Isabel, um, you, you wrote the following in a brief. You said, when it comes to helping the poor, we should think carefully about what these programs will do, not just to reduce child poverty in the short run, but also to expand opportunity and social mobility in the long run. And this is a sentiment that um, Scott Winship was on a panel with us this morning was talking about. Uh, could you elaborate on that a little bit, please? Uh, sure. And like everyone else, I want to thank you for including me. This is a very uh, interesting discussion. I really like what uh, Gary just said about short run versus long run elasticities and about the swap with the standard deduction and the personal exemption, because those are things I've been worrying about as well. But to stick to your question for a moment, um, I really do think we have a bias when we think about poverty and when we talk about poverty and when we measure it, because the easiest way to measure it is just to look at a year's worth of income and how much a particular, any particular program is gonna change that income in that one year period, because that's the way the data comes. And I think what we, you know, and of course, from a humanitarian uh, perspective, uh, we want people to not be, you know, having, uh, problems with uh, basic material needs, even in the short run. So I'm not saying we shouldn't care about short run poverty at all, but I do think we tilt too much in favor of it as opposed to looking at longer term effects on upward mobility, on the ability of children, people who are children today to become middle class when they're adults. And um, the way you do that is um, by focusing on things like education and parenting and a lot of other things, uh, not just income. Now, I'm not saying that a um, less, that more income won't mean less stress for a parent, especially if uh, a parent is a single parent and that therefore more income coming into the household, especially if it's a very low income household, won't help to improve the prospects for the children. But when you talk about the cost effectiveness of different approaches to intergenerational poverty, and you're talking about spending $1.6 trillion over 10 years, which is what we were talking about in the Build Back Better bill, I don't think that is the best way to allocate that much money if we care about long-term and not just short-term outcomes, and if we also care about fiscal responsibility and cost effectiveness. So I suggested a um, revision of the proposal, and I still like the idea that we can get something done on the child tax credit. Um, maybe this is you know, the old thing about hope, um, uh, always um, uh, trumping, uh, experience trumping one's hopes, but um, assuming we could get something done and maybe on a bipartisan basis, I think what it might look like is a somewhat smaller child tax credit, much like we have now, say $2,000 per child rather than three or 3,600. Uh, I think we should target it much more. I would start phasing it out at an income of 75,000, uh, not like the original 2017 version, which goes up to 400,000. Really don't think children and families with $400,000 of income need a lot of help. In fact, I'd call that just a tax cut in disguise. And I think we've had enough tax, tax cuts for the wealthy in recent years. So uh, I would target it a lot more. I would include some linkage to work and I just would make it a different kind of linkage than what we have now. I think the current structure is way too complicated and um, you, know, you have to have a certain threshold amount of earnings of $2,500. Uh, and then you, for every dollar of earnings beyond that, your CTC phases up. 
That's very complicated. I think it was based, as someone uh, suggested a moment ago, on the structure of the EITC. Uh, and that a lot simpler way to do this and keep some linkage to work is just to say, to be eligible for the credit at all, you have to have some work history. And what do I mean by work history? I mean that maybe over the last two or three years, uh, based on your payroll taxes, you've worked at least half time on average, I don't mean in every quarter, um, and uh, that we know that about you. And so Oh, I'm so sorry, Isabel, if yeah. I may just interrupt. So, so you, you, you said a few things there, and I, I want to pick up on, on um, you, you talked a little bit, I, I believe you were referring to the ARP when the size of the CTC went to $3,000 right. and right. $3,600. What I want to pick up on is a very specific part um, of, of that extension, which was monthly payments, right? Whereas Chuck correctly pointed out, um, you know, in mid-July last year, families started getting a check in the mail effectively. Um, Sophie, um, you and your, your colleagues, Megan Curran and Zachary uh, Parolini, have, have quantified how monthly payments in particular uh, have been particularly useful. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit um, about why the distinction between monthly payments versus an end of year credit or payment, assuming you have the refundable component, is important. Yeah, so um, Zachary Perlin developed a method for evaluating poverty under a monthly framework, and it was really motivated by the you know, great labor and income shocks that were experienced during the pandemic, as well as the policy shocks. So you have you know, high rates of unemployment, as well as like unemployment benefits turning on and off and supplementing incomes, but there was so much flux from month to month and trying to understand how those dynamics affected family income across the year. Now, traditionally, poverty is measured, as we've been talking about, kind of with an annual framework where you're totaling all of your income within the year against a poverty threshold. Um, what the monthly poverty measure does is, is looks at, at income received within a month and evaluates that against a monthly threshold that's just the, the annual threshold divided by 12. Um, Earlier on, it was, again, showing these impacts of UI payments and stimulus checks, but with the CTC, it really offered the opportunity to understand in more real time what the effects of these monthly payments were. And with the rollout of the first payment in July, you saw 3 million children under this framework moved above the monthly poverty threshold. And by the time of December, it was 3.7 million children. And you see a consistently lower child poverty, child monthly poverty rate in the months that those payments were being administered. So it's just a very good visualization of kind of the, of the economic stability that was presented by those monthly payments when they're presented in a lump sum time or around tax time. It's, you know, a one month dip in the poverty rate and then it, it goes back up. But I want to note that uh, Crystal Hamilton, who works with us at the center, has a, a brief coming out specifically about this and can poverty spells across the year and how they're different under a monthly versus lump sum payment structure. Um, so you know, that's what it looks like in terms of poverty, but there's also just the fact that monthly payments can be used to keep up with monthly expenses. And people have mentioned that so many people reported using the CTC to pay for food, to pay for basic needs. And oftentimes in the EITC literature, you hear about people paying back rent or back debt. And with these monthly payments, people were kind of seemingly more likely to keep on top of those expenses as opposed to you know, accruing up a, a debt over time, which then they pay off around um, with a tax credit at tax time. So building on that uh, theme specifically, uh, Chuck, uh, you know, I, I believe you have some uh, authorship or some scholarship, I would excuse me, uh, where you say the following. One of the things uh, advanced payments do, following up on Sophie's point, is it affords more flexibility in how funds are used. And, uh, you and your colleagues at CBPP have documented how low-income families in particular uh, spend uh, the CTC and specifically you know, you know, some aspects of the advanced payments. Can you talk about this a little bit and explain why it matters? I think there's a, you know, there are some misconceptions about how you know, poor people in particular are spending these monthly checks that they're getting from the government. So, Yeah, no, that's that certainly been in the news, but if you look at uh, some of the census data, right? I mean, I think what we found with the monthly payments started to flow was that people paid, put money right in the bank account, went to shop for groceries and electrical bills and clothes um, and just basic necessities. And again, exactly as designed. 
right? Fewer kids going to bed hungry. And now what happens is the, the rug gets cut out for them right when what's going up? Food prices are going up sharply, right? You've got a war in Ukraine, obviously putting pressure on food prices. You've got energy prices rising. And for low-income people, at the same time as their incomes get cut, they're facing very higher, much higher costs. So I think really, I think this that's why it's sort of sad that total inflation debate has kind of come as an excuse not to do something when really for low-income people, it's a really reason to do more. Um, so also I just want to pick up because I think two words really are important to emphasize. You know, Bell said uh, stress, right? And Sophie said stability. And I think it's just, I think, you know, for affluent people, it's just, I think it's hard for us to get an idea of like how stressful it is to be poor and how smart kids up and are picking up on stress and how important stability is for kids and for families. And this, you know, take a family, I, I think about a family, you know, mom works as a home health aide, right? Takes care of elderly people, has a toddler and a second grader, right? She makes about 20,000 bucks. She was only getting about half of the child tax credit. You know, with this new, you know, last year, all of a sudden she was getting $550 a month, right? Just knowing that that money's coming in, right? She can plan on that. She can get childcare, right? She has just, it just makes such a difference to people. And I think again, over time, right? For kids, and I, I agree with Bill, you know, you want to have education, you want to know all these things, but just the money, right? Income for family, right? For kids, the research, right? There's was in early days, the research really focused on work and we you know, talk about Kevin's work, a lot on work effects, labor effects, but over in you know, the last couple of decades or so, since it's been in effect for a while, you have a lot of emerging research on the health of kids, right? Both when they're young and when they're old, if they, they do better, right? The extra income on their educational team, the extra income on what the effect is when they become adults and how much they work, right? People are concerned about work, but what about how much these kids are going to work, right? They find, we find they're going to work more if they, if they grow up with some more income. So I think, again, I just think the labor market, the lives of low-income people, it's just different than what we, you know, affluent people, you think, oh, you know, take it off early, go watch my kid's soccer game. <laughs> a poor person, you know, they have a low-wage job. Their kid gets sick. They miss, a, they miss a day's work. They get fired. It's just, it's a different world, right? So I think we got to keep our mind on this, how important stress is, how important stability is in these people's lives. Well, just building off your point about stress in low-income households, I believe there is a, a pretty significant body of literature that documents how increasing stress for low-income households results in reductions in overall longevity as well. So, you know, I think that that literature is quite, is, is quite sound. Um, however, that being said, you know, again, when it comes to understanding the issue of monthly versus lump sum payments, there seems to be a bit of debate on this. So, um, Kevin, uh, you know, I know that uh, there's, there has been a lot of media attention uh, surrounding this particular topic, um, but I think one of the concerns you have raised is this notion that evidence suggesting that monthly payments are, for lack of a better word, preferable uh, to a single lump sum um, is, are better, uh, is somewhat misleading. And perhaps you could just elaborate on that a little bit. So, so one point I would make is that the current child tax credit already is provided monthly, at least in terms of the non-refundable portion. When someone files their taxes, they file, set it up in a way that that'll come out of their, their paycheck each, each pay period. So that's already monthly. Um, but I think some of what I'd like to push back on a little bit is on some of the real world evidence that people have put out around what we've seen in 2021 regarding employment and poverty. Um, so I think the central point on employment, so our study did was a simulation. We simulated that 1.5 million workers would drop out of the, uh, parents would drop out of the workforce as a result of a permanent um, expansion of the child tax credit or really replacement of the CTC with the child allowance. Um, and there's been some studies coming out looking at what actually happened during 2021 with this temporary um, conversion to a child allowance. And I think as Garrett mentioned earlier, and I'd like to emphasize any work effect that one would see, we'd expect to see it not to happen right away. Um, and even the studies, I think they're set up wrong. They look at what happens once payments start in July. If you really thought people were going to respond to incentives, they should have started responding in, in March um, when the policy actually uh, went into effect. Um, similarly, on the po monthly poverty estimates, I don't see as much value to going to a monthly period. 
Um, for example, in March and April of this year, families will be getting half of their uh, expanded CTC amount. So $1,800 for a, a young kid below six. So I think their estimates will find that you'll see a, a dramatic drop in child poverty in March and April of this year. Um, but is that better than the annual period that we've used that census uses for both the official poverty measure and supplemental poverty measure? Um, I'm not so sure. Um, also, just due to late data limitations, um, the data that's being used for these monthly poverty estimates is not actual income that people have. Um, it's all a simulation of how much income people, they think people will have based on their employment. Um, it doesn't capture actual income from earnings. It doesn't capture income from the child tax credit payments themselves. So I think we're more in the dark than um, some people may think regarding what effects there were in the 2021 period, and then also how we should think about how those effects would translate into long-term impacts of a permanent um, CTC expansion. Garrett? What is your view on, on the notion of lump sum um, versus monthly payments? Yeah, I think there, there's some, some things that we can learn from the uh, sort of the, the psychology and how people approach, particularly lower income households approach refunds during tax time overall. There does appear to be both anecdotally and in the literature some evidence that, um, and it's really intuitive, it makes a lot of sense that people tend to view lump sum payments a little bit differently and may use them a little bit differently uh, when it comes to their finances uh, and their planning often for large one time uh, uh, catch ups on, on debt, as, as Sophie had mentioned, or other uh, hitting other financial goals. Uh, often folks, of course, may confuse their refund with the amount of taxes paid. And so shifting toward a monthly payment can uh, does have that, uh, I think, advantage uh, potentially of dislodging some of that uh, uh, potential distortive thinking there and trying to uh, shift it to, to being used uh, on a monthly basis for everyday expenses and, and uh, not um, uh, not conflating it with your overall sort of refund of the way you might use it there. Uh, I think there, there is some benefit though for some households who do um, make an intentional decision to, to have a, a larger refund and use it one time. It's often a forced savings program for folks, if you will, uh, albeit an efficient one. Uh, but giving that optionality for households is really important. Uh, that's something that I think we continue to refine in the administrative process if we decide to move forward with a monthly uh, payment. Uh, either as part of an expanded CTC or even building it into the existing one uh, for folks to easily be able to switch between one and the other. We did see some of that challenge in the first, uh, in, the, in the expansion last year uh, with some folks getting it who didn't want to and vice versa, um, or even just, just hearing about it, right? I think there's, there's some data that, you know, we, we still haven't gotten all of these households who are not uh, used to getting this, uh, that expanded credit at the time uh, on board and knowing that the, that the option was available and, and just getting it during tax time. Uh, so, um, yeah, lots to think about there in terms of the administration of that and um, giving families that option if it's uh, helpful for them. So this morning, uh, Kevin, your, your paper came up when we were talking about you know, the number of people who drop out of the workforce uh, if there is no work requirement. Uh, and what I want to do actually is pivot slightly uh, and talk a little bit about if there were a work requirement, how much work or rather how much income do you need to earn? in order to claim something like a child tax credit. Um, so Isabel, uh, in, the, in you know, the policy brief you had sent me, you, you had talked about this, you said you called for a work requirement. Um, and I'd like to hear what your th thoughts are regarding how much income should someone have to be able to claim the credit? You know, I really don't care how much income they have. It's because it is a work requirement, it's not an income requirement. And so if you have a very low wage, uh, that's, uh, not an issue for me. Uh, what I want to see is that you worked uh, at least half time on average, and I'm make, you know, this is uh, an arbitrary uh, design of a policy. I mean, if it's a third of a time or two thirds of a time versus, I mean, you know, that's just something for Congress to work out. Um, and uh, for how many quarters or years, uh, two or three, I think is about right. Um, I want people, I, I think I didn't stress enough initially, that in my proposal, the CTC becomes fully refundable. Uh, everybody, regardless, gets the $2,000. And it's much simpler, because all you need to know is that somebody worked a certain number of quarters for a certain amount of time. 
I mean, I wouldn't want it to be, you know, just that you have to have worked some because, you know, people might game the system and only work a week, a quarter or something like that. But some reasonable amount of time for a reasonable number of quarters. Now, this means when you're in a recession or when somebody is down on their luck because they lost their job for some other reason or because, uh, you know, they suddenly had a family emergency or a baby's just been born or whatever, uh, you can have a period of non-work and still get the uh, credit, but uh, you don't get it permanently uh, without doing some work. And, you know, in addition to this issue of what the uh, work uh, effects are that Kevin and others have worked on, um, and there will always be a dispute about what the work effects are, but I tend to think they're positive over the longer run, as he argues, and as I think Gary was arguing as well. Um, but we don't know exactly what they are. They might be relatively small. And as I think Chuck said, if it's only a small amount, well, why not just make the trade-off um, in return for reducing poverty? But my proposal, by the way, still reduces poverty by 20% because it's so much better targeted and because of the full refundability. Um, so and so if you wanted to increase the amount above 2000, well, we could look at that. If, the, if To me, it's whether the political system will permit that uh, given the costs of it. So uh, about, if I was really worried about work, the first thing I would do is raise the minimum wage from $7.25 an hour. That's just crazy in today's economy and society with the kind of uh, prices and expenses that Chuck talked about. Well, I think certainly, and this is something Sophie alluded to earlier, uh, is you know emphasizing the difficulty of claiming this particular credit, and that's something we, we actually document in our in our report. Um, you know, Isabel, we the, we were talking about effectively making the the credit fully refundable on the front end, assuming you have some work history. We had Oren Cass on this morning, who has proposed something you know has proposed something similar. You know, but but you know, Chuck, if I, if I may turn to you, you know, CBPP broadly advocates for having a child allowance. Uh, but that being said, what are your thoughts on a work requirement and more specifically, how stringent of a requirement, if there were one, how stringent of a requirement that would need to be to claim yeah, something yeah. like a yeah, no, just, so, so our view, yeah, definitely, is that we think it should be fully refundable, right? We think most people work, most people want to work, will work. But at certain times in their life, you know, they have young kids, not necessarily bad for a single mom to stay home with their, with their toddler. So. I think just the benefits of, of, of to children so far outweigh any minimal employment effect. But you know, we'll see how these things pan out and negotiate. I think what Bell is hitting us on is, is allowing prior work experience. I think it's been you know like good to see that Senator Romney, right, who, who started with a fully refundable one, but then has talked about if he had a agreed to work requirement, he, he'd like to have. Uh, people's earnings before they had kids count. I thought that was a, a welcome development. Um, so, you know, we have to see how it shakes out. But I think, you know, I think we have to understand that people over their lives, different things happen, right? When, they, when you have a young child, right, you're just, your income's going to go down, you're less likely to work. And that's, that's a, actually, if you think about the whole original design of the child tax credit, was actually to encourage middle class women not to work. Right? So, I think that that is a fun thing, right? If people are, are students, right? If they're disabled, right? You want to account, you want to, you don't want to punish them for, for those things. And if you really, if you want to have parents work, right? You just need to do more childcare, right? Childcare is very, very expensive. Even a, a healthy child tax credit is not you know, going to help you, but it's not going to pay for childcare, right? I think, and this is why if you think about this, this bill that the house passed, it's a combination, right? It's a expanded child tax credit, it's child care, it's paid leaves. You don't get fired when you have a sick kid, right? So all those- And it's pre-K. Yeah, pre-K, exactly. So, I mean, I think it's, you know, that, that it was so coherent, right? And I think it, it, it got a bad rap somewhere. But I mean, it really was a full package. Um, so, so again, again, if I, if, if yeah, I can okay, pick sorry. up on, on, oh no, I'm so sorry, Chuck, I was going to say, if I can pick up on what Chuck said, you know, one of the, the concerns we hear a lot um, with regards to the CTC is the, are the challenges people face in claiming it, specifically that you have this phase in rate, or, or at least post TCGA getting 15 cents on the dollar. Um, and one of the questions that comes up is, you know, whether or not people actually make 
you know, a decision to work or not work on the basis of the fact that they are making or losing 15 cents on the dollar, um, you know, for, um, you know, for every dollar they effectively bring in. What, what do you think? Garrett? Oh, I'm sorry, that was, the question was you. Sorry, that wasn't uh, wasn't clear. But uh, yeah, I think on the on the work requirement uh, aspect of things, there is um, the the other thing to keep in mind is that there's work requirements in both the child credit and the earned income credit, and of course they're both adjusted for the number of children that you have. So we have simultaneous to a work requirement uh, sort of adjustments for household sizes in both of those credits. And so one one idea, which would be tricky to implement, and the, the details matter here, of course, is to separate out. Uh, the uh, the credits on the basis of a work related credit and then a child related credit that could be made uh, could, you could remove the means testing and the work requirement altogether. Um, uh, again, separating those things out, it would be challenging. But to the extent that there is uh, sort of a, a policy rationale and politically uh, a um, a push for uh, rewards to work and not wanting to reduce those relative to current law, having a work related credit uh, that's dedicated to that makes a lot of sense. Uh, the, the challenge is it's now built in to both the child credit and the earned income credit. And there's a lot of complexity there when you think about the fact that uh, the various tests, uh, especially for relationship, residency, identification can vary for both of those credits. And they're often being claimed at the same time by the same households uh, on the basis of work and the number of children that they have. So there's a lot of advantages there, I think, in terms of um, the administration and simplifying things to get back to uh, what uh, Sophie and Chuck were talking about uh, for stability and, and removing sort of that stressful aspect of uh, getting the, these benefits to low-income families um, that benefit the most from them. Uh, and, and that, of course, also folds into the larger discussion of uh, really where should this child benefit be administered? Uh, is it, uh, I think there's an interesting conversation being had about uh, whether or not if we had uh, a more universal child benefit, could we take it out of the tax bill altogether? Uh, place it in another agency, such as the Social Security Administration. Lots of tricky issues there, of course, on identifying and uh, ensuring that that, that uh, agency can administer it properly relative to the IRS. Uh, but that that does open up, I think, another different uh, set of possibilities uh, with that that type of proposal um, that still maintains the, the work incentives that are pretty important, as Kevin's research has demonstrated. Ashley, so, could I come in on this administrative simplicity uh, issue? Sure, Isabel, please go ahead. Um, we wrote a paper my, my, with my colleague um, Morgan Welsh at Brookings called um, Too Many Tax Credits for Children. Uh, its title is actually the American Family Plan, Too Many Tax Credits for Children. I just want to remind all of us, I know the rest of the people on this call know this, but I don't know if the people listening do. We have three of them right now. We have the CTC, the Child Tax Credit. Then we have the EITC, the Earned Income Tax Credit. And then we have the uh, CCTC or the CDCTC, but the Child Care Tax Credit. And um, they all have different eligibility uh, requirements, different designs and parameters. If you're a low-income family, especially if you're a single mom and you're working full-time and trying to take care of kids, the last thing you need is have to figure out and apply for three different tax credits. So this is on us. By us, I mean the people who designed these policies. We have done a terrible job in terms of simplifying things. And I think we really need to do that. I think as Gary was suggesting, that's hard to do. You need a whole tax reform package, et cetera. But those of us who work on these issues really should be thinking about how to do that well. And um, I think it is critically uh, important. Um, so we, we are slowly running out of time, but I do want to leave some time for questions. Uh, one of the questions that has come in actually is for you, Sophie, um, and it's with regards to child poverty specifically. Uh, it says uh, the easiest way presumably to address child poverty um, would be to have an allowance. But absent having an allowance, uh, could you talk a little bit uh, or speculate um, you know, what the best way would be to address child poverty, assuming you did not have an allowance? Yeah, so I mean, I think one, it's a great question. Something that comes to mind for me, though, is that when we're talking about child poverty, which you know, is a persistent issue in the United States, nobody thinks this is a kind of like a one policy fits all is going to solve this problem issue. It's, a, it's about an agenda of policies that deal with things like the fact that families are you know, being 
have to move from like <laughs> frequently throughout the year because rents are going up or you know food prices have been, people have been talking about so it's i think more about an agenda of policies the housing is obviously something i think a lot about living in an area which has like very high housing costs particularly for families with kids and and high rates of turnover in families with children in terms of apartments um but no matter what that you know policies are included in that agenda i think something providing direct cash payments to families such they can make their own decisions from month to month as a refrigerator breaks one month and then the next month maybe it's it's harder to purchase food i think that's an, a very necessary part of of keeping um families economically stable or feeling more economically stable and i do want to just push back on one uh comment earlier which that was about the merits of a monthly versus annual poverty framework and i i think that idea of stability and what is displayed from the monthly framework and how it can show how incomes are fluctuating across the year is actually very important because it's speaking to um, the dynamics that families are facing in terms of the money in their bank account. And it, it puts a, um, it visualizes that and shows that. And I, I do believe that that's an important component of understanding the challenges and dynamics that families are facing. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly think that I think there's been some work that the NBER has put out um, in which they have shown there were significant changes in how the stimulus payments were being used uh, over time, you know, after the pandemic hit, which largely reflected the economic situation households were in as the pandemic got worse and then slowly started to get better. Um, the next question is for Kevin. Kevin, what changes need to be made in the CTC? to encourage shared parenting of children when the parents are living apart. Uh, Low-income, non-custodial parents who want to co-parent their children often don't have the financial resources to do so. Um, so the existing CTC, you basically get the amount um, based on the kid. Um, so I guess if you had two parents, um, one claims the kid and the other doesn't, it shouldn't really affect how much you get. Um, so I don't know that the CTC is the best place to actively encourage um, parents uh, to, to come together. Um, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, Kevin, well, I think you know, one of the, the claims we hear often is that, you know, uh, particularly that if you want to claim the CTC, or the, you know, we want to encourage for some groups, at least we want to encourage be married. Right, because very often when people, when you know, children raised in households that are, uh, you know, where there are two parents that are married, typically tend to fare better. Of course, the research on this is a little bit less clear because, on the one hand, we see kids fare better, but you know, there is very little evidence to suggest that you know, low-income parents themselves who are married necessarily fare better. Typically, in low-income households, we see higher rates of intimate partner violence, etc. Mm -hmm. So, I'm just wondering if, if uh, you know, having a marriage incentive, if you will. Uh, to be able to claim the CTC is a good thing. Yeah, I mean, I guess there is there I, there is an existing incentive in one way in which you have two separate parents and say they're both not making enough to get the full CTC benefit. If they come together into one tax unit, um, they may now have enough earnings or taxable tax liability altogether to get the full benefit. So I think the existing CTC, I guess, does to a, some extent encourage uh, parents to cohabitate and hope for being the same tax unit and marry. Um, I certainly think that's a, a good laudable goal. Um, but I, I don't think I would, I wouldn't change the existing tax credit, um, to do more of that, um, in any kind of active sense. Um, we have another question for Chuck. Chuck, research shows that low-income families spend CTC dollars on basics like food and bills. What does the data say about the substitutability of these dollars? In other words, does the CTC increase the overall amount of spending on these types of items, or does the CTC free up people's paychecks for other things like savings, et cetera? And I'll turn to Garrett after that because I think you have some thoughts on this as well. Please go ahead, Chuck. Well, I think the I mean, I think the, the surveys were just where you put the money. And I think it what it underscored is that that these families, you know, low-income families who now got this infusion of funds where just how tight their budgets are, right? That they that this is where they spend their money, that they need to 
they need they need enough they they fall short they need money to spend on basic needs right they really want to keep the lights on so they don't have to move change apartments every few months right they want to be able to provide their kids enough food so just it just i think it was a reflection that they just and so many things like you know affluent people just have cushions when things happen right low income people they just live so much closer to the edge uh, so i think that was really the, the main message of that data Go ahead, yeah, just add to that briefly that the yeah the, the only sort of code I'd put to that or caveat is um, it'll be important uh, to educate folks if we shift to a you know a, a more permanent uh, monthly payment structure uh, about how that will impact uh, their refunds uh, so they are aware of that they were planning on it um, uh, we did see some of that a little bit of that I think in, in this year's tax season where there was some depending on the nature of your financial situation and whether or not you took the monthly payments it may have impacted refunds slightly. Uh, just because folks tend to evaluate things, uh, the tax system, especially on that basis, uh, whether or not that's um, that's a good thing is, a, I think, a different discussion. But just meeting people where they are there will be important. The other thing uh, worth mentioning and highlighting, of course, is making sure that we do either codify or improve on protections for folks who miscalculate uh, the various parameters that are needed to determine their monthly payments, uh, including um, income is part of that, that was less of an issue with, with this uh, particular setup with the expansion for lower income folks, but the, the bigger uh, challenge is protecting those folks who may, due to complex family situations, incorrectly claim a child. There was some protection in Safe Harbor, of course, in the rescue plan, but investigating that a little closer, refining that, making sure that folks there are, um, that we balance the need to protect folks who make mistakes in good faith um, will be important. We're almost out of time, but I just wanted to, oh, I'm sorry, Chuck, go ahead. Yeah, just two seconds. I want to just come back. I, th I think, I think picking up Gary's point, I really want to be, be very clear to people what their circumstance is going to be. But I think it's worth noting that I completely agree with that the monthly payments provide stability, but that people think about lump sum differently. So I think you, you, the result here would be child tax credit monthly, right? EITC for low income families is a lump sum. So I, I do think you'd have kind of a nice uh, a mix there. When point taken for middle class people, as Kevin says, is you know, it can just shake out and you withhold it. But. We are almost out of time, but Bell, I just wanted to give you a chance to, to, to chime in here on your thoughts on a monthly versus a, a lump sum payment, specifically as I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I have um, much to add uh, on that particular issue, Ashley. I think that everybody sort of said what needed to be said about it. I do want to go back to your question about upward mobility and you know what we should be focused on whether you know short term poverty reduction or upward mobility and i want to talk about the racial gap there because i think it's so important and as raj chetty has shown and others as well upward mobility for african american children is very different than it is for white children even when they're both from poor families in other words we've held constant poverty per se of the family and when you look at it by gender and race, where the really bad news is, is for black boys born into low income families, they just don't move up nearly as much even as black girls. So, you know, this leads me to worry about young black men and what's been happening to them and whether they don't need, even if they're not living with the mother of their children, a more generous EITC. It was so interesting to me that you put a lot of emphasis on gender equity in the paper that you wrote. And when I think about gender equity, I think the problem is uh, not the you know a discrimination against single moms who happen to be women. It's also a discrimination against uh, single dads and just unattached young males especially young black males who are doing so badly and we need to do more for them. And I was disappointed when MDRC did their research on a EITC for singles, uh, you know, in New York and one other state, I think it was Georgia, Atlanta, um, and found good effects for women, but not for men. And I don't know what that's all about, but I just think we need to start, start worrying about that. Thank you so much, uh, Bill. Well, we, we are- It's in time. the house, Bill. Oh. Okay, well, good. <laughs> well, we are out of Very time. Um, thank you to all our panelists. Thank you so much for your time um, and for your insight today. Um, for those of you that have tuned in, the video will be up, uh, available on our, on our website. Um, and please feel free to reach out either to myself or any of our panelists with any questions. Thank you all so much. Have a good afternoon.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you.